Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Raphael Ndaus. I'm a registrar in the Division of Otorhinolaryngology at the Next Surgery here at the University of Cape Town. Uh, welcome all, and thank you for joining us for this presentation. And we would like to remind you that you can use the chat function below to ask any questions and to write your name in the university that you are affiliated to. And thanks once again for joining us for this meeting. So our topic today is sinonasal mucosal melanoma. Uh, so I've got uh, nothing to declare and all my presentation is referenced. I've put in the references uh, in every slide uh, that I'm going to present. So the melanoma is derived from uh, melanocytes. So we know that melanocytes are neuroectodermal derivatives uh, that migrate to the skin, retina, uveal tract, and other ectodermally derived mucosa. Uh, they migrate less frequently to endodermally derived mucosa like, for example, the nasopharynx, larynx, tracheobronchial tree, and esophagus. And uh, because of their less frequent migration to such mucosa, that's why you get a lower frequency of a melanoma in these locations. That's part of the reason why. However, the function of uh, mucosa and melanocytes is still unknown. So, in terms of uh, cyanonasal mucosa melanoma, this is a uh, a very rare disease. It represents about 0.7%, less than 1% of uh, melanomas. We know that the majority of these occur in the skin, more than 90%. And uh, they represent 4 to 8% of cyanonasal malignancies as a whole. Uh, there's an increasing, however, there's an increasing incidence in uh, cyanonasal uh, cavity melanomas. The mean age at diagnosis is uh, late, about 65 to 70 years, according to literature and the diagnosis is usually difficult and late because there are no specific clinical signs or any risk factors. At the time of presentation, about 5% of patients will have a lymph node metastasis and about 10 to 15% will initially present with a distant metastasis. However, if you follow up all these patients from the time they present, you'll find that 40 to 70 percent of them eventually develop a distant metastasis and such metastasis is usually to the lungs, liver, bone and brain and this is the cause of the main treatment failure in cyanonasal uh, mucosal melanoma. These tumors have high metastatic potential as I've said and they, currently there is no evidence-based treatment concept established. This is because they are very rare so because they are rare you don't get enough numbers to uh, get to know what the trend is in terms of their treatment and their response to treatment. However, what is established, what is in agreement is that surgery is the mainstay of treatment and as we shall see, the management of the neck is controversial. I'll go in quite a bit of a detail about this later in the presentation. And there's a, a low five-year overall survival rate. The age of pathogenesis of a uh, cyanonasal mucosa melanoma is not known. Uh, these mucosal melanocytes are found in about 20% of uh, healthy subjects and it is a neuroectodermal tumor as expected because that's where the melanocytes uh, are coming from. And under cutaneous uh, melanoma, exposure to ultraviolet radiation is not a risk factor because of the anatomical location in the nasal sinuses and in the paranasal sinuses. Uh, the presentation of these patients, the commonest presentation is epistasis in nasal obstruction. Otherwise, they also present with a facial pressure and a nasal mass. And the mass is usually either in the nasal septum, in the, that's the commonest site where you find it, in the anterior part of the nasal septum, and in the inferior tepinate and the medial tepinate. They also can present with a numbness. That means if the tumor is, for example, embedded uh, the infraorbital nerve, they will have numbness in the face. They also have pain, as expected with cancers. And they can also have a rhinorrhea in the neck mass. So this is very much less frequent. The microscopic appearance of these tumors when you do an endoscope uh, in the clinic, they are usually fleshy and ulcerated. They are described as being polypoid, a polypoid infiltrating part with a rich vascular network in the underlying connective tissue of the respiratory mucosa. Uh, about 50 to 75% of them 
uh, will be pigmented. And such pigmentation is described as either brownish or black or reddish or crimson or gray white. But you can also get the amelanotic type where there is no pigmentation. The differential diagnosis is quite wide. Uh, it includes uh, angiosarcoma, layer myosarcoma, spindle cell carcinoma, poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, non keratinizing uh, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, undifferentiated cyanonasal carcinoma, high grade non Hodgkin large uh, cell lymphoma. And there are two stagings that are used for uh, cyanonasal mucosal melanoma. The first one is the HACC, which is the eighth edition. So you'll find that uh, most of the papers that I was looking at, they were using the seventh edition because this is, this is quite new. And the difference with the earlier edition of the staging is that uh, once you diagnose the, the mucosal melanoma, that automatically makes it a T3. So there is no T1 and no T2, it's just, just the, the time diagnosis is a T3. And that shows, that's a reflection of the aggressiveness and poor prognosis of these tumors. So T3 is actually limited to the mucosa and immediately underlying soft tissue, regardless of thickness or greatest dimension under the cutaneous melanomas. And for example, this can be a polypoid nasal disease, as I've said, pigmented or non-pigmented lesions of the oral cavity, the larynx or pharynx. And the T4A is a moderately advanced disease, and this is a tumor which is involved in the deep soft tissue, a cartilage, a bone, or overlying skin. A T4B will be a very advanced disease. This is a tumor which involves the brain, the dura, the scalpers, uh, the lower cranial nerves from 9 to 12, the masticator space, the carotid artery, a prevertebral pre space, and the mediastinal structures. Uh, these are the sort of tumors that uh, are difficult to get a clear margin in, and they're usually treated palliative. And in terms of uh, uh, lymph nodes, uh, they can either be NX, which is a uh, regional lymph nodes, cannot be assessed, and uh, NO is N0 is no regional lymph node metastasis, and N1 is the uh, regional lymph node uh, metastasis present. And in terms of distinct metastasis, it's either there's no distinct metastasis for M1 phase distinct metastasis. So the Palantine's clinical staging system has been in use since the 1970s. It's, it's very simple. It stages the melanoma into three categories. Either it's localized disease, or it's got cervical lymph node metastasis, or there is distant metastasis. However, when, when the patients are followed up, you know, there's been a comparison according to the study which I've shown there in the two classification systems, the HACC and the Palantine the clinical staging system. It's been found that actually HACC predicted more, predicted more precisely the disease prognosis uh, compared to the compared to the Valentine uh, system. So, in terms of the diagnosis, uh, we need tissue biopsy. So, uh, you can do an incision biopsy, and such an incision biopsy should include the remove normal tissue. And of course, this should be done after having made sure that it's naturally not coming. It's not one of the, the differentials that's uh, popping through the brain like an encephalus, otherwise it may cause a CSF leak. And it, it's important that when you do this biopsy, it can either be done in the clinic or it can be done in theater. But uh, because of the risk of bleeding, you must make sure that at least you've got the facilities to control the bleeding if you're doing it in the clinic. Otherwise, it would be safe to take the patient to main theater to do the biopsy. And when you're doing the incision biopsy, you must uh, include a, a room of normal tissue so that, because otherwise that may have a, a precursor to the lesion. So in terms of the histopathology, these tumors are described in terms of the architecture and the cell type. In terms of the architecture, they can be described as either solid or desmoplastic or pseudopapillary. Now the pseudopapillary type is the most common one that is found in, uh, in the sinonasal uh, region. 
and they can also hear the saccomatoid or neuroendocrine like or a combination of any of these uh, architectural patterns. Uh, the cells are either described as, as being epithelioid, rhomboid, uh, spindle shaped, or plasmacytoid, or multinucleated. And they tend, to, they, tend to be, they tend to be an invasion of underlying connective tissue like cartilage uh, and bone. So, in terms of the, uh, the types of the, of the cells and the architecture, uh, the first one is a solid pattern which shows a round to epithelioid uh, tumor cells which are compactly arranged in sheets and there is tumor necrosis as can be seen in the bottom uh, left hand corner of the, of the slide here. And the sort of papillary pattern, the one that's uh, common in cyanonasal, that is exclusively found in cyanonasal mucosal melanoma, it consists of small and shattered cells which may resemble a neuroendocrine carcinoma or a small round blue cell tumor. Uh, these cells appear molded like in a jigsaw puzzle pattern and they've got a high mitotic activity. And then the third type is sarcomatoid a growth pattern which is composed of spindle shaped cells with an intersecting fascicular pattern and they are indistinguishable from a layer myosarcoma or a spindle cell carcinoma and this is when uh, the histopathologists tend to do uh, immunohistochemistry or staining of these so that they can distinguish them. The epithelioid morphology, these are cells that are ovoid in shape uh, with a minimal cytoplasm and occasional prominent uh, 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 nucleoli. The multinucleated, as the name suggests, they are multinucleated uh, cells which are hyperchromatic and with epimorphic uh, tumor uh, giant cells. So this is the stain which is normally used, there are two of them that are commonly used to confirm the diagnosis of a, of a cyanonasal mucosal melanomas. This is the S S hundred stain, which shows a positive nuclear staining for the melanoma cells. And the HMP45 stain, which shows membrana staining uh, uh, pattern for melanoma cells. And then when you go through literature, there are these uh, genes that are frequently mentioned, the KIT, NRAS, and PRAF gene, they co consistently come up when you read uh, about melanoma in literature. So like the KIT gene comes up in about 20 to 40% of literature as having uh, mutated in the patients, in the cohort of patients that have been studied. And the endras gene comes up in about 40 to 45% of the time. The BRAF gene is very common. It's got a, a mutation commonly in the cutaneous type of uh, melanoma, but rarely does it uh, come up in the cyanomas or mucosal melanoma. It's not usually mutated. In terms of the diagnostic workup, one is to exclude a metastatic melanoma. This, you have to exclude it as a source of the lesion you are looking at. If you do an, an, a, a nurse endoscopy in the clinic and then you, you see the melanoma, you either exclude that maybe that uh, what you are looking at uh, could be a metastatic from somewhere or it could be actually the primary uh, lesion itself. So it's important to do a total body skin examination and I said a, a nurse endoscopy at the clinic and also CT and MRI to delineate the extent of the primary disease, a chest x-ray to look for metastasis and where it's available a combined PET and CT of the chest abdomen and pelvis to look for any distant uh, metastasis. A CT scan and this is a CT scan of, of a patient who had a left cyanonasal uh, mucosa melanoma. As we can see, it's quite an expensive lesion which is involved in the right maxillary, uh, uh, the maxillary sinus, the left maxillary sinus, so it's not right, it's the left maxillary sinus, uh, the ethmoid sinus, and the medial wall of the left orbit, and the frontal sinus. Uh, the MRI findings, these are the, these are the typical uh, findings that are described. That there's a high signal on T1 weighted image, uh, you can see this tumor is on the left nasal cavity. And then, but then if you check on the T2 weighted image, you find that uh, there is a loss now that side. This being the classical, however, when uh, a series of patients were followed up uh, in China, these were 36 cases, and most of the studies they actually come from China because they've got a very high uh, rate of uh, cyanonasal mucosal melanoma. So when they followed up these patients, about 36 of them, they found that 15 patients get the MRI findings that I described. However, more than half of them get atypical findings, and this included mixed signals in T1 and T2 weighted images, low signals in T1 weighted images, 
why signal so this will be a reversal of what you would expect in some of the maturating people signal in T1 uh, and high signal in T2 weighted image. So one should be aware of this when you interpret the MRI findings. So in terms of the prognostic factors, there are good prognostic factors and bad prognostic factors. Uh, the ones that are good are if the tumor is coming from the nasal cavity, the vessels those that come from the paranasal sinus, like the maxillary sinus. And also negative margins are very important, like in most tumors, and also the degree of a pigmentation. If it's more pigmented, then it's safe to have a good prognosis. And the bad uh, prognostic factors are if there's neural invasion and the uh, lymphovascular invasion. Uh, in terms of the treatment of these tumors, this is done in MTT in a multidisciplinary team. Uh, as I've said in the introduction, there's lack of uh, randomized evidence in terms of the best practice of how to treat these tumors. However, there is agreement that there is a, one should aim for a complete surgical excision uh, with clear margins. So like all tumors, when you treat them, you look at patient factors, uh, the tumor factors, the stage, the grade of it, and also institutional factors in terms of the skill set available, the equipment, and the oncological uh, surgical expertise that is available at, your, at the institute. So the treatment is divided into two. It can either be surgical or adjuvant. A surgical treatment is, can either be endoscopic, and that is the main treatment these days. It's, most centers uh, treat these tumors endoscopically, but also you can do an open uh, surgical procedure. And in terms of the endoscopic and open procedure, there's no randomized evidence in terms of the ideal approach, but uh, they found that actually the outcome is the same whether you do an endoscopic approach or an open approach. So endoscopic resection uh, uh, is made up of uh, endoscopic skull-based resection, depending on the extent of the tumor and where the tumor is, uh, tumor location can be methamidectomy or a maxillectomy or a spinodectomy. Uh, as I've said, this is the main method of uh, resection of these tumors. It's a piecemeal resection, which initially people were skeptical of because they thought that you should have a complete margin, so you can't do it piecemeal. But however, it's been found because uh, endoscopic resection actually allows a closer anatomic view of the tumor and it actually helps with the resection of the margins. And also this preservation of anatomy which ensures a complete uh, surgical resection. However, you do need a high level of skill to do this type of surgery and you should be able to convert to an open resection if needed. So in terms of the open resection, um, the first step is to do a soft tissue approach to expose the bone. So, the three type of procedures that are used is the lateral rhinotomy, uh, which leads to excellent exposure of both nasal cavities and the medial maxilla, and is a cosmetically acceptable incision. So this uh, uh, photo I took it from uh, the Vula uh, guidelines, the open access ENT guidelines. So that solid line there represents the lateral rhinotomy uh, incision. And then the other dotted lines uh, actually for the uh, web of incision. So this is the web of Ferguson incision uh, with the lip split and inferior lead incision uh, in addition to the lateral rhinotron. So the inferior lead incision should be as close as possible to the lower eyelid so as to uh, avoid any post-operative edema. Coincidentally, we did do this incision this Monday and the patient is in theatre, it's still in the ward. Uh, though it was not a sinus or mucosal melanoma, it was actually an adenocarcinoma. And then you can also detect a soft tissue approach would be a mid facial declaring approach, which allows elevation of the soft tissues of the mid face. And you can also do an addition of intercartilaginous incisions to the sublabial incisions. And then after you have exposed the soft tissues, then you can go ahead and do your pony work. And this pony work depends on where the tumor is. So you can actually do a medial, for example, medial mass electromy, you can go ahead and do a total max electron, we can also go ahead and do a kind of facial resection, for example. I did not go into detail about this, these uh, procedures, the details of them, because they are freely available on the internet. If you tune into, if you log on to the open access class of the uh, EMT, uh, which is produced here at, at, at UCT, you can find quite detailed anatomical review and surgical procedures and how to go about it. Uh, there's also the caudal loop procedure, which can be done, which is a sublapial incision that allows you to access to the, the maxillary and trunk. Uh, radiotherapy is often used as adjuvant therapy. When this 
when these tumors were first uh, being treated, there was a, a concern. There was uh, they were actually regarded as radio resistant, but then now it's generally it's generally accepted that uh, radiotherapy has some efficacy against melanoma. It does improve uh, local control, but uh, it is not shown to improve overall survival. And this has been replicated in so many studies, including the one that I uh, have shown you. In terms of systemic therapy, this is divided into two. It's either chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So chemotherapy includes the uh, drugs like the uh, dacapazine, uh, cisplatin, minplastin, uh, tamoxifen. And uh, in terms of immunotherapy, it's mainly interferon alpha and uh, interleukin-2. Uh, in terms of the systemic therapy, there's mixed evidence uh, of the effect uh, on survival. For example, Moreno et al. They, uh, did a retrospective analysis of uh, 58 patients, uh, 14 of which had chemotherapy and 21 had uh, immunotherapy as part of the initial treatment. And they found that there was no survival benefit uh, uh, with, with uh, post-operative systemic therapy in these patients. However, uh, some et al. They found uh, a twofold increase in the five-year survival for patients who received interferon and interleukin-2 biotherapy versus those who did not uh, this was after they did a multivariate analysis. So the jury is still out in terms of the, the, the systemic therapy. And the other area of, uh, of controversy is neck management. Uh, what do we do with the neck? This is controversial because uh, cyanosis and mucosal melanoma really leads to you know, nodal metastasis. And actually the National Comprehensive Cancer Network actually recommends that neck dissection should only be done for clinically proven not metastasis, and they actually don't recommend an elective neck dissection. And this is based on the assumption that a rational occurrence rate is not a factor in the prognosis. Uh, in general speaking, uh, this is to perform an elective neck dissection, uh, one has to take into account factors like the risk of occult not metastasis, the rational occurrence rate, and if the neck is being included in the operative field, and also in terms of the uh, salvage rate survival, and uh, if one considers whether is guaranteed of, uh, of seeing the patient again, in other words, if there's regular follow-up is guaranteed or is not guaranteed, and also the morbidity of the operation itself. And so far, there are no studies uh, to compare the uh, elective neck dissection and the uh, observation of these patients. Uh, this uh, is a large review, the study which I showed when I, that photo which I showed. Uh, it's a large review of patients uh, which consisted of 15 studies, uh, a systematic review, which consisted of 936 patients uh, with a median age of about uh, 68 years. And of those, only about 0.4%, so about 30, 40 of those patients had uh, an elective neck dissection. And the cumulative regional recurrence rate in these patients was 18.4%, it's quite high. And the, also the regional recurrence rate in the clinical not negative patients was 17%. And if you look at these figures and you think of the stoma cell carcinomas, the indications for uh, elective neck dissection, we normally do elective neck dissections if we think that there is a chance, like a 15 to 20% chance of a, a nodal metastasis. But then if you look at these figures, 17 and 18.4%, you will start wondering whether there could be a cohort of such patients who have a cyanosal and causal melanoma who could have benefited from an elective neck dissection. However, there's no consensus on the clear cut on the clear cut of point for the regional recurrence rate, which is able to justify an elective uh, neck uh, treatment. So, in terms of neck management, there are a lot more studies that are needed. Uh, for example, what is the impact of a regional metastasis on survival? Uh, Lund et al. found that actually there was a waste outcome in patients who had regional involvement. And uh, Amit et al. found that lymph node status was not associated with disease recurrence or distant metastasis or survival, uh, despite an overall 30% risk here for uh, neck metastasis. Uh, they, they were writing in the Cancer Journal and this published in 2018. So, uh, as I've said, uh, are there some patients who for cyanosis or mucosal melanoma who could benefit from elective neck dissection? For example, maxillary sinus tumors are characterized by high incidence of regional metastasis compared to the sinus subsite. 
So we should all the patients who have got maxillary sinus, uh, sinus and cause of melanoma actually undergo an elective neck dissection. Yeah, that's the question. And we know that is a strict relationship between uh, post-operative morbidity and uh, the dissection of specific neck levels. Uh, what neck levels uh, should be dissected? And if you look at those patients who presented with a, a positive lymph node uh, so with a cervical node uh, metastasis, 56.6% uh, at ipsilateral uh, level 1 lymph node metastasis and 35.8% at uh, ipsilateral level 2 uh, metastasis and there was a low rate of metastasis uh, on the contralateral side. So if you can figure out which neck levels, if at all they're going to do a neck dissection, if you can figure out which uh, neck levels to dissect, that will help because we know that a uh, neck a dissection carries its own morbidity. So in terms of uh, survival, as I've said, cyanomas on cause of melanoma carries a very a worse prognosis and the median survival is about two years. And it's got a low five-year overall uh, survival rate, which range from 20 to 50%. Actually, that 50% is actually high because uh, some of the studies, they're actually quoting that it could be around 20 to 30%. Uh, this, as compared to other tumors like adenocarcinoma, which is a 53 to 8, about 50% uh, five-year overall survival rate, or squamous cell carcinoma, that's got about, also about 50%, and 70% uh, for adenocystic uh, carcinomas. So in, in conclusion, uh, cyanomas and mucosa melanomas are rare tumors with a poor prognosis, and the knowledge of best practice and their management is uh, still evolving as more research is being carried out in this rare disease. Uh, the current literature actually supports a uh, primary surgery uh, followed by uh, radiotherapy. Thank you very much. And I will open uh, this up for any questions and uh, comments. Okay. Uh, I would like to invite us to a coffee is on the call. I would like to invite Prof. Liber to... Hi, Hi Raphael, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear yes. me. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for a nice presentation. Yeah, so I think that when it comes to sinal nasal melanomas, I mean, they're very uncommon. I think in my 18 years, I've probably only managed about 10. So they're quite uncommon tumors. So one thing. The second thing is they're very unpredictable tumors. You can have a patient with a, a, a very small sinal nasal mal malignant melanoma that you excise completely that die within two years of metastatic disease. And then you can have a patient like we, we all know we've got this um, one patient that had a, um, essentially a very large lesion involving the cribriform plate that has um, you know, done very well without local recurrence or metastases for 17 years. So they're unpredictable. You, do, you can't say which ones are going to do well and which ones aren't not. Um, so the important thing is complete surgical um, excision resection, if you can. Um, and something that uh, Professor Rickera from uh, Pittsburgh taught me is, for one, it is better to resect these lesions endoscopically, um, if you can, rather than doing an open approach, say a lateral rhinotomy. And the reason for that being um, that the tumor seeds all along those external incision lines. So you've got a very, very high risk of seeding. Um, so even with, with your endoscopic approach, this is the one place where I would use a, a throat pack. Um, you, you want to prevent those um, uh, cells kind of uh, spreading all over. Um, so you also need to be very careful um, whatever instrument you use uh, to wash those instruments off. You know, if you use, if you touch, say, the, the opposite side of the of the nose, so you can really implant the, the melanoma. And I had one patient who died of a, um, a gastric melanoma and, uh, about eight years after his primary resection for maxillary sinus melanoma. And I always wondered whether that was something that seeded uh, intraoperatively, you know, with, with all the fluid going down the, the, um, the stomach, into the stomach. Um, the other thing that you said is uh, obviously complete resection and in-block resection. And I find with the melanomas, it really 
is impossible um, endoscopically to do it in block. These lesions are very, very friable. You know, you just touch them and, and they break. So to, to be able to, to really resect them and get around them is quite very, is very difficult unless you've got a lesion that's really localized to say the septum or the turbinate where you can amputate that structure. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, it, it, it is unfortunately a piecemeal and then you can send off um, say the lamina papyracea or whatever for your, for your margins uh, separately. Um, and then uh, lastly, I don't know if you've, uh, I think you've spoken about the, the, the neck quite extensively, but in my reading, I know that if you have a patient with a um, positive node, your five-year survival is essentially 0%. So um, we haven't operated, I haven't operated on, on any, uh, done any endoscopic resection for patients who's had a, a positive neck node. I think most of them then get palliative uh, treatment. Um, and these cases, you also want to follow up with a, with a PET scan. So in our oncology center, these patients normally would get a PET scan a year later or two years later and then, and then follow up. Um, and then I don't think you mentioned um, the uh, treatment with immunotherapy for those patients who are BREF uh, positive. Did you did you go into that at all? Uh, yes, there is a mention of interferon alpha, uh, interferon alpha in, in, in yeah. that treatment. Yeah, I, I think that is. Yeah. yeah, so it's important when you when you biopsy these lesions or resect these lesions to to uh, to ask them to test for the BREF, um, because if it is positive in in uh, uh, metastatic disease specifically, they do uh, uh, better on the immunotherapy. Um, and then something that we've done differently to the literature and something that we've published as well. I think Tasneem published um, our our patient that did well. It's um, with brachytherapy, so we do uh, for the for the nasal melanomas. If it's localized to a to a specific area, to do a complete endoscopic resection, um, and then uh, uh, do a, a brachytherapy implant in that area, rather than external beam uh, radiation. Um, obviously, if it fills the whole nasal cavity, you need external beam radiation, and and we've uh, we've actually got um, a pretty good long term survival. Um, in those patients, but but most of them eventually do die of metastases. I think that's about uh, it from my side. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, I saw Dr. Hill at his end raised. I don't know if he's got any comments to make. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, also, a few comments uh, regarding uh, from a pathology point of view. Quite a few of them are um, amelanotic. Um, and that actually can pose a challenge to the sort of the average general histopathologist because the differential diagnosis of uh, a melanotic uh, melanoma is, is usually a lot of clear cell uh, neoplasms and that's got, got a wide differential diagnosis. So the, the best uh, still is that histopathologists must apply the uh, basic immuno panel and not trying to go and fly into a differential diagnosis that uh, may include some of the rarer clear cell neoplasms. And I think it's important that Vamantin, although it's a marker that uh, not everybody uses, is still a, a, a very important key marker for melanoma. And I have caught out melanoma uh, just on two markers, which base uh, Vamentin and uh, basically uh, HMB45 or Melan A or even S100. And uh, so in the basic panel, Vamentin should also be always be included uh, because with two markers, you can actually already distinguish quite clearly um, the uh, a melanoma and especially when they're amelanotic, because basically they don't show anything, they're just clear cells. Uh, they're also S100 positive, but not always, not always reliably. And I think SOX10, uh, which is a, a marker of uh, tumors with, with neural, uh, ectoneural uh, origin, is perhaps a little bit more sensitive. And then you've got obviously melan A and HMB45 as, as um, 
confirmatory markers. Uh, it's not always necessary. I, I think that uh, melon A is, or HMB45 is probably good. And then there's a, a mitogen uh, transaction, B, Arthur MTB, which is a new marker, which uh, is uh, not always everywhere available in case these melanoma markers fail. And the second point is that uh, metastatic melanoma in lymph node is not always sensitive to S100 and uh, HMB45. And that can be a problem, especially if you're hunting for uh, micrometastasis. So just be aware that um, if, you, if you want to really confirm, um, then the histopathologist needs to probably have uh, access to uh, probably S100 and, and MTB. And, uh, and that's it from me. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask a question. Thank, thanks, Michael. One question, maybe more for the pathologist. Um, we've all got a lot of experience in pre-malignant lesions that um, uh, progress to squamous cell carcinoma in the head and neck and even cutaneous SEC. But I was just wondering about pre-malignant condition, uh, pre-malignant lesions that progress to melanoma. So I know there's dysplastic nevi with various grades of dysplasia. But are there, are there any other lesions that we should know about? And in the context of head and neck, um, apart from the skin and buccal mucosa, what other sites would they commonly be found in? Thanks. You want me to answer? Yes, please. Um, you know what? Mucosal melanoma is uh, rare is rare to catch in an early stage. I think the only area where we ever catch uh, mucosal melanomas when, they, when we think it's of mucosal origin is in the oral cavity. Now, uh, pre, uh, so-called pre-malignant or, or potentially malignant melanocytic lesions of the oral mucosa uh, are rare. And it's, um, it's difficult to catch them because most of the melanomas of the mucosal area do not have a so-called so horizontal progression pattern. I don't know what they spread. They tend to actually invade immediately. And um, they, as is different to cutaneous melanoma, so um, they, they're more, more akin to the melanomas you find on the, on the foot. I just forgotten the term. So they tend to be invasive. And uh, I think it's acro something. Uh, Acrolentigenous, that's right. And so they invade immediately. Uh, it's very, very little, uh, I would say, uh, possibility for a clinician to catch, uh, let's say, a, a pre invasive melanoma. Uh, it's not, not like cutaneous melanomas, which, which have uh, uh, a horizontal uh, growth pattern of atypical melanocytes. So, yeah, I, I, I actually, I have seen once a melanoma that, that was already invading from the mucosa and had some atypical melanocytes in the adjacent epithelium, but it's rare. And I think in the nose, so in the nose, it's even more difficult because when are you going to actually catch one? Uh, because it's probably an opportunistic uh, uh, finding. Thank you very much. Uh, I see there's a hand that is raised from Tony Ndomba. You can make this go ahead. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you for your presentation. I just have two questions. One is about the histological variant. Um, I don't think, uh, or maybe I missed it, but they didn't make a mention of the desmoplastic variant. Um, just hold on. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, yeah it's, it's better. Can you hear me better now? It's, it's a little better. So I have two questions. Um, the first one is about the histological variants, including the desmoplastic variant of the mucosal um, of, of melanoma. Is it the, one of the variants that occurs in the synonasal mucosa? And the second question that I have is regarding the complexities of the neck, um, determining whether you should do a neck dissection or not. And especially since you mentioned that the level one ipsilateral lymph node is the one that usually is the most common set of localized metastasis. 
would a sentinel lymph node biopsy be beneficial like the way they do with breast carcinomas? That's all. Okay, thank you. I think I think the first person on this plastic can I educate that to Dr. I don't know that you had the person. Yeah, okay. So melanoma can look like anything. Um, and that's the problem. So it's a masquerader of many other different types of uh, of tumor. <laughs> So all these variants, yes, you you would just have to basically go through, comb through your differential diagnosis. But as I said, you can catch it out very quickly with uh, Vimentin and S100 or SOX10 in your basic panel. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, you know, they can, but as I said, melanomas can look like anything. They have got no pattern, specific pattern to uh, that they follow, that they present with. It's not like uh, dermal uh, melanomas, which are much easier to, to spot. Uh, thank you. So on the second question of the sentinel uh, lymph node biopsy, I, I, I came across it when I was uh, going through literature. It seems like it could be useful for other tumors. Uh, but then not for cyanonasal uh, mucosal melanoma. It has been found not to be not to be but the sentinel lymph node virus. I don't know if this is something else to do. Maybe Prof. Uh, okay, is there anyone else with a comment or question? Uh, okay. So thank you very much everyone for, uh, for joining. We hope to meet you again on Friday. We'll send out the uh, notification in terms of what we'll be discussing. Thanks again for joining us and have a very good day.